We're, we're actually in my audio booth right now. It's like you're on a spaceship. That's how you get such good sound because uh, the vacuum of space, there's not a lot of transference. Absolutely so. nothing out there. Yeah. And then some books kind of pad things out a little. So everybody, this is Mary Robinette Kowal, who is an author and also various other things. And we've been friends for a while. And she just had a book come out called The Spare Man, which I just finished and which is an absolute delight. Thanks. It's, It's space mystery, space murder mystery. Nobody is safe on this spacecraft. Um, and but it is also um, somehow feels, despite the fact that it's in space, it feels like it takes place. I don't know when. When when does it feel like? It feels like it takes place hopefully in the 1930s because that yeah. and early 40s because that's when the the Thin Man movies were happening. Gotcha. Except it, it, in many ways, it doesn't feel like it takes place in the 1930s because we've all got we've got very updated sensibilities. So if you've ever thought I'd like to consume some 1930s media, but without all of the racism and sexism, uh, <laughs> this is for you. Hello. <laughs> I try. I try to please. Yeah, I, I mean, I love the uh, the Thin Man movies. Have you have yeah. you seen those? Yeah, my mom was a huge fan. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was I was basically like, I would like the Thin Man movies, but in space. Um, and yeah. So that's that's what I did. So, so you're like, let's do that for me. <laughs> I, I have the ability to do that. Yeah. <laughs> typey it's typey. A, it's amazing the extent to which the only thing that will get me to write a story is feeling like no one else can do it for me. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I will get I, it. Yeah. Those and and um, like I use the website uh, for the words and I will write for a pair of digital wings that I will never get to touch more than I will a paycheck. None of that made sense to me. What what oh. what is for the words for the words is uh, sorry. Yeah, it's a um, it turns writing into a role playing game. So you get um gear you can have you have an avatar um Mm. so let's say that you need to write 500 words you can write a monster and the metric for defeating the monster is the number of words you write and the time in which you write them Mm. um and i it works distressingly well this sounds great i so i i my trick for for writing is that if i'm not writing at least a thousand words a week which i know is not a lot then i'm not writing anymore This isn't like a trick. It's practically true. But if I don't write for a week, I'm not writing anymore. I don't Mm -hmm. know what's up with the characters. I'm not thinking about it in the shower. I'm not like, I forget where they are physically, Mm -hmm. but also mentally in the story. I forget where the drama is. I forget where the tension is. I forget like, you know, I can work on the chapter I'm working on, but like I've forgotten the. So, so what happens is after a week, I need to like read everything I wrote again. And that's just a really big barrier. So I need to keep doing it. I know that that barrier is there. So it's double-edged sword. It keeps me from from not writing for a week. But then right. when it happens, then it's like months before I get back in. Mm, the, this, the struggle is real. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, one of the tricks that I've learned, uh, because I, I frequently have um, spans where I cannot like you know, I, I'm travel or family or what Mm -hmm. have you. Yeah. Um, and I, I used to, like, when I started writing, I was touring, um, as a puppeteer. And so my time was just like completely random. So the trick that I learned is putting down what I call breadcrumbs, um, which is that at the end of a session, I write down a note to myself about the thing that I was planning to have happen next. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when I come back to it, I read, like whatever the section I was had just written, mm-hmm. I read that section. I make small edits as kind of a warm up, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, and then pick up with the breadcrumbs. Um, and usually, I find that if like I I'll try to be like, okay, what are they doing now? I need a goal and I need a a physical sensation, which is basically like, where am I and what am I doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I also like to not finish the chapter. Um, mm. So I feel like if like if I finish the chapter in a session, I either have to start another one yeah, or no, I have to like consciously be like, actually, I'm not done with this chapter or like delete even to be like, I need something to pick up in the middle of so that I like whatever flow I was in, then I can try and reestablish instead of building it from scratch, which is a very hard thing to do because as you're writing, you do want to, you want just like when you're reading, you want 
to reach that mm-hmm. satisfaction of being like, and then he fainted. Yeah, Cory Doctorow says that he he sets a word count and that he will stop when he hits that number of words, regardless of where he is in a sentence. And I'm just like, my brain rebels at this oh, idea. Yeah. That's how well it also rebels at the idea that I would know how many words I'd written that session. I, like, yeah, I've, I've not got a counter going. I, Corey has very, I've talked to him about his process before as well. And I'm just like, that's, I'm never mm. doing any of that stuff that you just no. suggested to me. Yeah. <laughs> he but says Corey... he, he, he once told me that he reads all of his chapters and then he has to cut 25, some arbitrary percent of words out of every chapter so that the yeah. book will be tight. And I'm like, nah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like all those uh, words. <laughs> no, the it's called the uh, the the ten percent solution. There's a, a book, uh Ken Rand wrote it. Mm. I think um I think Stephen King talks about this too, but basically the idea is you go through and you cut ten percent um as a, a means of making sure that these are all the words that actually need to be there. And that is something that I a hundred percent did when I started writing. Mm-hmm. Um and what I have found is that as I've gotten deeper into my career, I have trained myself to naturally cut those words as I'm writing them. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to cut as as frequently. I think that I am a fairly spare writer. Like I don't think that I I'm I'm trying to get I'm trying to get someplace. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like I'm in general, I'm, I'm padding. And, and usually what, what more often happens is like a whole big hunk comes out where mm-hmm. it's like, yeah. no, I, I wrote this and it's great. And it helped me understand the character, but no one needs to know about this. Yeah. 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 Uh, which I love. I love that. I love that. I know more than you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> about the, the, the same. story. Yeah. Some of my, my favorite things are deleted scenes that just like, this was a lot of fun and does not belong in this novel in any yeah. way, shape or form. Yeah. So, You've got a space mystery on your hands. Um, there is uh, a murder that happens live, uh, <laughs> and then and then you have to you have to find all of the people who could have done it. Mm-hmm. You have to find all of the ways that they could have done it. You have to find all of their tensions, all their secrets. Everybody has a secret. Mm-hmm. Everybody lies. Everybody has secrets. Yep. And I confidentially i'm also <laughs> working on a kind of murder mystery well i guess it's not really a kind of murder mystery it's a murder mystery mm-hmm. um i think it's it's less agatha christie more michael Connolly, uh mm. in, in in terms of how it functions but um but there's overlap there even mm-hmm. with all of that space between a- and it's tricky yeah it's so hard yeah yeah so i uh i did use the agatha christie model of writing a mystery um, in that I knew I knew how I wanted the deaths to happen because there were certain science fictional elements that I wanted to use to kill people. Mm-hmm. And um, and then what she said that she would do is that she would just give everybody motive and opportunity. Right. And then when she got to the end, she would decide who had actually done it. Mm. Um, and I I split the difference. I I have. There's one person that I I 100% knew was involved. Um, And then there were other people that I was like, they may be a collaborator, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, and then had to go back and do a lot of cleanup afterwards. That does seem to be like, yeah, because because it's not like Agatha Christie finished the book, decides who does it and is done. Uh, I hope not. All of those sentences, because like there's lots of clues when, in the end, there's lots of seeds, but I, I assume once you find that out as the author, you can go back and be like, what is the way that I can make this so obvious, but entirely not obvious? Yeah. Um, and a lot of it is also like grabbing things that you've already planted. Um, mm-hmm. Like uh, one of the murders... Um, I I had happen in a different way in the book. And then when I was doing my reread, I was like, well, you've got this murder weapon just sitting here that you never use. And <laughs> <laughs> why don't yeah. you why don't you use that one? Mm-hmm. I, I can't spoil anything, but there is a moment where you think you found out who did it and it's devastating. And and he does seem a little bit too good to be true. Mm-hmm. And is very carefully never on stage when the murders happen yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh thanks for not keeping me uh in in limbo for too long on that one because i was I not ne- happy in those moments no i nearly ended the chapter right there and yeah. then I was 
no, no, I'm going to end it someplace else. Yeah, come on. I was hurt, like, hurt people... the reader. That's the, <laughs> that's the new the new way of doing it. Put them in pain. They like it. Yes, we yes. all want to be on Twitter. <laughs> but we can't we can't enjoy happiness. No, be something no. else you like. No, that's that's ridiculous. So I have um I have a first reader, um, mm-hmm. uh, and one of the things that I do is I'm like as I'm writing I'm like is this going to make Alessandra try to throw the book across the room? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. It's, it's all about manipulation. I mean, yeah. it actually is. Yeah, I um, I used to, well, yeah, I, when I was doing puppetry full-time, that was the, the running joke was that I was deeply manipulative because yeah. that was literally my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could just like make people laugh, make them cry with a puppet. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's, yep. Yep. yeah. I mean, we call it manipulation for mm-hmm. a reason. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're manipulating the the people and you're manipulating the uh the the fabric. It turns out that it's actually um very much the same skill set because like as a puppeteer my job is to take the body language that we do naturally, break mm-hmm. it apart into its semantic components, reassemble it with an inanimate object in a way that's human readable. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing the same thing when I'm writing except that the thing I'm reassembling it in is words. Right. But the body yeah. language that I'm describing is the same thing. Mm-hmm. Writing a couple of novels has opened the door on some things that maybe I wish weren't opened on. <laughs> One of them is that whenever I read a great body language or a great expression or a noise, that's not a word, but like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I can I picture the author doing that in their chair, which yeah. is what they are doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but they, absolutely. They are just they're going to like... Yep. <laughs> like trying to suck air through their teeth in every possible way to understand mm-hmm. which air sucked through teeth we're yes. trying to convey with this one. Yes. And the, the amount of times I'm sitting at my desk and release a breath that I didn't know I was holding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So your uh, main character, Tesla Crane, is a lot of things. Mm-hmm. She's an engineer. She's an heiress. Um, she's, a you know, I think the equivalent of a billionaire, whatever that is in the future. Um, and, uh, she also is disabled and she has PTSD because of a terrible, terrible, one of the worst things I can imagine. Yeah. Um, where she's the only survivor of, of a number of her, her friends in a, a space accident and has, a, has an amazing service dog that is extraordinarily lovable and has an amazing, uh, brand new husband and th- i just felt like there was a, there was a a lot to balance in that character of like her awareness i mean you're doing an excellent job from what i like from what i've seen of like the ultra wealthy i've interacted with of of understanding that um that balance between like i want to be a good person and then like when something when ultimately it's like okay i'm gonna play the card uh yeah. that i am who i am and you're gonna do the thing i tell you to and then but balancing that with you know, being a wife and with being disabled and with being um, and with dealing with PTSD, all of this at the same time. And also, um, you know, trying to desperately solve a murder, even right. when no one wants you to. It did mean focusing and spending a lot of time on Tesla as a mm-hmm. person. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that that, you know, I never was like, that's not enjoyable uh, because she's great. W- were you were you cognizant of like the ch- the 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 size of the bite you were taking off to chew? This is a yes and a no. Um, When I, when I started the, um, started the novel, I knew that I wanted her to have uh, chronic pain Mm -hmm. um, and have mobility. Um, And I knew that it was from an accident, but until I got kind of deep into the novel, I like, I I hadn't started the novel thinking about her having PTSD. Mm -hmm. Um, So I actually had to go back in. And originally, Gimlet was not a service dog. Um, Gimlet was just a dog. And as soon as I realized that, oh, no, she would actually 100% have PTSD from this, Mm -hmm. um, I I went back and rewrote Gimlet. Um, So like one of my favorite scenes I had to cut because I'm like, this service dog would not do this in this situation. (laughs) Yeah. so Gimlet's based on two dogs. Um, she's based on uh, um, a friend's dog who is actually named Gimlet and is a Westie um, and is 
so cute that she does not look like a real dog. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, based on my mom's dog, uh, she has a service dog um, for Parkinson's and uh, it, it's, and, and um, which is very handy. And then I guess actually a third dog, because I have a friend who has a sensitivity reader who worked with me on this, who, um, who has a PTSD service dog. Um, and, and it's really interesting, like how varied the dogs are, but, but because of that, like I had to go back with Tesla and, and make a ton of, it was like probably, I was in the first third of the novel when I had this realization, but it was still a lot of going back and, um, trying to figure out, uh, how she was moving through the world, the ways, you know, exactly what her triggers were. Uh, making sure that I knew what those were and new situations where they were likely to be and, you know, and also unex- things where you would not expect it to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also meant that I, like, originally Gimlet was not with her, like most, she frequently left Gimlet behind. Um, mm-hmm. And so I had to, uh, the the two places that I leave her behind are both a little contrived. Um but it it was didn't feel that way to me. Good, I worked real hard on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But uh. But it, it also meant that I had to then the the biggest part of the big bite was keeping. I had to keep her alive in every scene, and I also had to keep this dog alive in every scene. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, but also you had to keep it so that we weren't sure. To keep not sure that is the dog alive now or is the dog not alive. I don't know. Maybe I'll tell you. Maybe I won't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you never want the dog to die. Yeah. The, the, actually, the one the one thing that I can uh, categorically like the, this one spoiler I'm completely happy to make for people yeah. is uh, that I will not kill a dog. You can safely know that the dog lives yeah, uh, in all future, present, past stories. Yes. The, the dog, dog does lives. not die. The dog does not die. Um, mm-hmm. I do not promise that the dog will be unharmed. Mm hmm. Because you know it is a novel, but the dog, the dog absolutely, definitely lives. So we, t- you, yeah, I think you brought up that you had some some expert readers of various mm-hmm. sorts. Uh, I, I, I find this so interesting and so useful. I, I initially approached it like sort of solemnly, mm-hmm. um, and then I, and then I realized I was like, oh no, this is like an expert reading of yeah. my book about a thing that contains things that I am not an expert in, but others are. Yeah. Um, so the, the it it has it became just like an absolute blast to so to, to talk to people. So I you know I obviously had like race and sexuality readers, but then in my second book I had it, it, my my protagonist had a facial like an injury to her face, and uh, and which people see and it's like mm-hmm. the first thing they see when they look at her. And so I wanted to talk to a person who for whom that is true, mm-hmm. and what. What a cool chance to talk about, like uh, to have a person like one pay them to read my book, and yeah. then two, uh, and and then two, like just like talk about like a different way of experiencing the world or having the world experience you, which is yeah. what one of the things I learned is that it's a lot of these things are much more about how they are seen than than who they actually are because they're yeah. just a, a person who's different from every person but like the the world is experiencing them differently and that's a one of my biggest learnings just from having women read my books who yeah. like a person wouldn't treat a woman this way in this situation yeah uh was it was more than like a woman wouldn't act this way in this situation because women yeah. all act different the the way i i tend to think about it um because I've I've done used uh, sen- subject matter experts sensitivity readers yeah. um, on a number of books and and I find that if I do treat them as a subject matter expert that uh, that there are there's a couple of things that I I like to do now which are different from the way I was when I started. Mm. One is um, like when I started I would finish the book and then I'd bring someone in to read it. Mm-hmm. And now if I know that I'm going to be dealing with something. Yep. Um, I try to bring someone in at the beginning so that uh, that as I'm constructing the book, that um, Mm -hmm. that those opportunities are there, that uh, that I'm I'm thinking about it and and not building a book that is, you know, inherently has a problematic core uh, in the structure. And then the other thing that I, I found is that when I started, I was very concerned about 
or I don't want to get things wrong. Um, and that now um, when I go in, I, I'm like, you know, talk to me about the joy as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and that I, I also talk about uh, skill sets um, like with Tesla, with the, um, with her, her injury uh, and the PTSD, honestly, um, I think of it in terms of what are the skill sets that Tesla has had to develop because of this. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, like when she, to, to keep from, you know, tweaking her back, she, she puts a hand on something to steady herself. She crouches with a straight back. She avoids twisting. And those are all skills. And so I, I, I have her activating the skills. And the only time I talk about the pain is when, um, when mm -hmm. she violates her normal because it's just her normal. You know, she's not wandering through the world going, I am in so much pain constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and and the same thing with uh, with PTSD, um, you know, like, and I started thinking about it because at, to your point, as a woman, I have a different set of skills than, you know, for, for walking down a, a street at night mm -hmm. than, than you need to deploy. Mm -hmm. um, and those are, you know, there, there's a, there's a bunch of things that I, for, for a long time, um, I thought that I did not experience sexism at science fiction conventions. Um, and then realized that it was because I was so good at spotting it and heading it off before it got bad mm -hmm. that I was discounting it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, it, you were, you had developed skills. I had developed yeah. skills. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's talking through to subject matter experts about like what are the what's the skill set that you have that other people don't have to think about deploying. And, and there's also just like uh, just a completely uh, unobvious parts of people's lives that you can get to by just having a fun conversation and being yeah. like, oh, it's just like doing any kind of research, you know? Yeah. Where like yeah. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that that's I, that that that's the history of Mexico City. The, the way that this. Uh, happened to me uh, the biggest way is that I I was looking you know because this story takes place in New York City um, and so it was like lots of different kind of people like you want to have lots of different kinds of people so I was like well what if there was somebody from you know the Caribbean who's part of this story and I was like anybody from like a Caribbean country like I can chat with just to like get an idea and this uh uh woman reached out and was like yeah I'm a I'm an editor so I work on books and I'd love to chat and uh she was um, from Jamaica, many generations, but she was Asian. And I was like, that's not my picture of what a Jamaican looks like. Um, and apparently there are lots of Chinese immigrants to Jamaica. And I like, they're a significant minority population there. And I was just like, mm -hmm. that's awesome. I have yeah. no idea. And so like, you get to go from being like a minority in your country to being a minority in my country, but like in a completely different way than, than anyone thinks when yeah. they talk to you. And so they talk to you and they're like, I don't understand why you have that accent. You're mm -hmm. Asian. And, and also like the idea of representation is really interesting because it's like, okay, what, like, are there any, is there anybody out there just sort of like represent, like saying like, let's represent a, a viewpoint that's just like, cause there's a lot, there's not like a lot of like you know, Chinese Jamaican Americans, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people who have not like non-traditional ethnicities and races that, and so like the idea of, of just representing this sort of non-traditional, like outside of an, a general norm was really fun. And I get to like learn a lot about that history. Yeah. I, I, and I love that. that I am um, the, uh, the nice thing about being a novelist is that it gives me a socially acceptable way to indulge my natural curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I try to give people like an honorarium because I'm like, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. Is and they're okay? going to be weird. <laughs> they're going to be strange. <laughs> um, I had this really great conversation this morning. Um, so the I'm working on book four in the Lady Astronaut series and uh, and, you know, before I start the book, I'm I'm talking with uh, someone who's a citizen Potawatomi nation, um, and because I I would like a, a a CPN individual on on Mars, and and so I I'm like you know I want you to I want to talk to you about how I build this character because they will have been born in the 40s and that's a very fraught period in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but she was just talking about the language, and one of the things that was really cool is that. 
there are instructions embedded in some words. So like, mm. um, like the word, I, I don't have it written down right next to me. So, uh, but the word for uh, hunt is uh, it, it's, it's a two syllable word. And the first syllable roughly means uh, walk, uh, no circle. And the mm. second means walk or I have maybe the other way around, but, but when you're hunting for deer, you want to walk in a re start by walking in a really big circle so that you cut a through the forest. Mm. So you find a deer path instead of just cutting straight through it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, and she said, there's a ton of examples of this where the mm. instruction is embedded in what the word is. And that when That's you just cool. look at it, yeah. And when you just look at a dictionary, you're like, you don't get any of that. Yeah, that's um, not that's not how our language is constructed. Yeah. No, yeah. no. I bet there are I bet there are some examples. Like somebody in the comments will be like, what about this English word that actually does have and I'm like, I bet you're yeah, I bet that I mean, walkie talkie. Walkie talkie. <laughs> <laughs> See, what, what do you do with the walkie talkie? You walkie talkie. Walkie talkie. You walkie talkie. <laughs> <laughs> Side note: One of my favorite memes. I was talking about while at a conference where I was doing uh, reviews, you know, critiques, and 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 it's you know what happens if you name everything the same way that the guy who named the walkie talkie. So you have the uppy downy, you have the any outy, uh -huh. and the next person who sat down for a critique her grandfather had invented the walkie talkie. And I'm like, you're kidding me. This is a joke. <laughs> Do you, uh, so you're working on lady astronaut now. Mm -hmm. so you've moved, you've moved back from, you took, did you kind of take a break? Did you want to take a break? Um, I knew how much research I was going to have to do to do Mars. Right. Um, and, uh, and also I just wanted to break <laughs> Yeah. I, well, the I wild thing the writing... is that like the first two Lady Astronaut books came out within like six months of each other or something yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. No, that was a that was a choice um, yeah. that we made. That was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. It meant, I, it yeah. meant I didn't have to wait long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the vagaries of publishing being what they are is when you when the second book comes out in a series, the first book, you get a, a jump. Yeah, yeah. And then a lot of people you know, wait to buy the second book it, or well, won't mm -hmm. buy the first book until the second one is available anyway. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. they were like, if you bring them out both at the same time, you get this, this surge. And, um, and it did like seem to do that for, uh, the, the calculating stars. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also meant, uh, you know, I, that, that was, that was two books written back to back. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you must've written them as one basically. I did. Yeah. Together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, originally it was actually going to be a single book. Okay. And then um, there was a, there was a structure problem. So well before it was finished, uh, I realized there was a structure problem and that it needed to be two. And so we split it and then they, they had to, how about, I was like, okay. I had the, I had the same thing where I thought I had one book and then I was like, oh, I finished this one and I'm not done. <laughs> well, that is definitely an end. So yeah. I guess we'll just call it done and send that one off, uh, which is nice because, yeah. but uh, how is like the publishing books. industry seems wild right now yeah. and in not a great way. No, no. It's been really interesting watching things. And, you know, I mean, interesting in the same way that um, major catastrophes are interesting. Um <laughs> Interesting in the way that acquisition of a social media platform can be interesting. And very interesting. This is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Like I, a lot of it right now is that um, people are still trying to figure out how to function in, you know, the, the, a lot of the models that they had set were set in the before times and they were already not working great. Mm-hmm. But inertia kept them going. And then you have two years where there's no inertia, there's no movement at all, and and everything then and, and at the same time a seismic shift. And so we come back and people are like, we don't actually know how to do this anymore. Um like talking to booksellers, the booksellers say that even though the audiences are way down for the number of in-person that the people at an in-person event mm -hmm. that having an in-person event still makes sense because of um because of the people who will say well i'm not going to come to that but i do want to sign book and they'll order 
Mm -hmm. because they know that the author is going to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, So it still drives sales, but just in a really different way than it did. Mm -hmm. And the online events, you get audience, but there's a steady drop off in the number of people who buy the book because Mm -hmm. for the most part, it's the author reaching out to their community and they usually have already done it. So Mm -hmm. a lot of it is, as far as I can tell, a lot of it is just so that you have something to talk about. Like the events themselves? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, here's an event that I'm going to do. And I, and, you know, and by having it, you know, talking about it, you will buy the book from wherever it is you're going to buy the book, Mm -hmm. or you will, it will remind you to mention to someone else that you read the book. Right. Yeah. And and I mean, I think that so much is audio and ebook now. Yeah. I don't know how much is audio, but it seems like every, everywhere I talk, like talk to people, like they've, they've read, they've, they and they're like, I loved your audio book. They'll say to me, like, "Yeah, I, mean, I had nothing to do with that." Um, you wrote for the, the words, the words. I guess I, I guess I had that part. But yeah. So whereas you have everything to do with all of it, it, it is. Um, I mean, narrator Mary Robinette has um, has has some issues with uh, author Mary Robinette. Like, why 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 did you like this? This is a book in space. Why is there Icelandic in it that you have to say out loud into a microphone? Why, why would you, you do could that? Have, you could have not done that to yourself. You could have, that was a choice that you made. Why Why yeah. did you do that? I mean, I had to, I read the the last the last chapter of my first book was from a different perspective than the rest of the book. And so I I was the narrator and the producer kept being like, you're changing words. And I'm like, yeah, I'm the author. I can yeah. do that. And he's like, you literally you can't. can't. Like, you cannot. no, that's not, a, I'm like, but I think it sounds better this way. And he's like, stop. You're not in charge right now. Yeah. So uh, here's a trick that you can do next time mm-hmm. that you are find yourself in this position. Um, record with the first pass proofs. So I'm very fortunate that um, because I sell mine to Audible mm-hmm. and they um, they let me record from, you know, first pass for people who don't know is the first time the book's been typeset. Um, so I record from those. Normally when I'm recording a book, mm-hmm. I'm doing the, the final proofs which are the things that are going off to the printer right and because i record from the uh the first proof the first pass um you're you're, you're editing i get to edit and make changes (laughs) yeah and then we just put those in the the final book (laughs) no more icelandic problem Uh, i mean did not in this book but i think in one of mine i i did get to a thing that i had written in portuguese and i was just like oh (laughs) why is it this long (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So the the Lady Astronaut series, uh, for for those who don't know, it is an alt- alternate history in which uh, the space race gets significantly uh, accelerated, or the space space exploration gets significantly accelerated by a natural disaster here on Earth. Uh, m- just a such a cap. Great. I love a first chapter that just like wrecks your whole day and sucks you right in and launches you through the whole rest of the story um so that's uh i will i'll never forget that that beginning to a series um and uh and it so so a lot of this stuff is happening earlier than it does in our world and also uh it um ends up involving more women than we did in our world though not without reticence if anybody watching this hasn't picked those up it's fantastic okay. um bear man the Spare Man uh, is is out now and is just a delight. I listen to it yes. on Audible myself, and you can get it. But you can get it wherever there are books. Would you like to meet Elsie? Oh, sure. Let's meet Elsie. Elsie. Mary Elsie. Robinette's cat knows how to speak. Yes. Come on up. With one of those, you may have seen them on Instagram or something. Button boards. Button boards. Come on up. There we go. This is Elsie. Hello. Hi. High five. I, Thank you. Uh, yeah, what, just... What's the most interesting thing Elsie has told you? Soon, stranger, downstairs, concerned. Soon, soon. <laughs> oh, 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 no. <laughs> was there soon a stranger downstairs? Um, was there something much to be concerned with? It was 2 a.m. I've seen that movie. I did not go downstairs. <laughs> She's like, all right, let's just lock it up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you. No, it was no. probably a, like a coyote in the backyard or something. Yeah. I was just yeah. like, Mm-mm, nope, no, no. That's and awesome. just like staring at the the door to the stairs. I was like, no, no, a hundred percent, no. Wow. We're not going downstairs. 
That's amazing. I was deeply skeptical about this. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're talking about my cat. Um, but I was deeply skeptical. It started it because of research on a book, um, as one does. And then um like was watching videos. I'm like, oh no, I think this is a thing. And the first time I, w- I knew with her that it was like, oh no, this is a thing. Um, she only had like f- four or five words at this point. Um, open was her first one. And so she says open and I go to open the door. And that then is, she says- that, that is not surprising having had cats. There's This, this door is, is closed. This open. door is closed. <laughs> right. Why? And then Why? you open it and they're like, thank you. I don't want to go out. I just but, uh, need you, thank to, you for opening. You just need you to understand that it needs to be open. Yeah. Um. So I open it and uh, she doesn't go through. Mm-hmm. Um. She presses open again. And I'm like, the door is open, open. Mm-hmm. Door is open. And she's like, open, help. I'm like, OK. So I walk back over to her and she walks away from the button board, which was in front of the door to the bedroom door, which was closed. Mm. It's like, oh, look at that. You've generalized from one mm. door to another, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. And I opened the door and her water bowl was in there, which I had totally, mm. like we were having construction done. She goes in, drinks, um, comes back out and goes back to her button board and says, open, love you. She thanked me for opening the door. 